Markov's rules to analyze a circuit. Specifically, we're going to determine the current through, the voltage across, and the power dissipated by the two resistors that you see here. As always, when using Kirchhoff's rules, we're going to start by labeling our junctions. I'm going to label mine J1 and J2. Next, we label our currents. I'm going to label this current I0. After junction 1, I'll have I1 on the right leg. Note that I0 does not pass through junction 1. This middle leg will be I2. And when I1 and I2 rejoin, we have I0 because the current coming out of that 1.5 volt battery needs to be the current coming back in. Also note that the directions of these currents at this point are arbitrary. We'll find out if we chose the right directions after we complete the problem. Next we label our loops. I'll label this loop A and this loop B. Just like the currents, the direction of your loops is arbitrary. And you can label this outer perimeter loop C if you'd like. I'm not going to. I anticipate we won't need it. Now that we've labeled our circuit, we're going to apply the junction rule. The junction rule states that the sum of the currents into a junction is equal to the sum of the currents out of a junction. So we're going to apply this to junction 1, and the currents in is just I0. So on the left-hand side of the equation, I'm going to write I0. And the currents coming out of that junction, we have I1 here and I2 here. So on the right side of the equation, we'll have I1 plus I2. This junction rule, by the way, is just a consequence of the conservation of charge. Now, if I apply the junction rule to junction 2, we'll have I1 coming in as well as I2 coming in. So on the left-hand side of the equation, it would be I1 plus I2. And we have I0 coming out. So on the right side, we have I0. This is exactly what we have already written. So we're not going to use that equation. Now we apply the loop rule to loop A, which states that the sum of the voltages around a closed loop is equal to 0. Starting in the upper left-hand corner, we're going to move clockwise around loop A. And the first component we get to is the 100 ohm resistor. Now here we're traveling clockwise, so we're coming down this leg moving with the direction of the current. This means we're going to have a voltage drop across the resistor, negative IR. So I'm going to write negative I2 times 100 ohms to indicate the voltage drop. And we continue to move clockwise around loop A until we get to our next component, which is the 1.5 volt battery. Here we're moving from low to high, negative to positive. This indicates a voltage lift, positive V. So I'm going to write plus 1.5 volts. And that's the last component in this loop, so I set it equal to zero. Next, we use the loop rule to analyze loop B. Starting again in the upper left-hand corner, we travel around clockwise until we get to the first component. It's a 9-volt battery, traveling from high to low. That means a voltage drop, minus 9 volts. Continuing around loop B we get to the 200 ohm resistor we're traveling clockwise which is with the direction of I1 that's going to indicate a voltage drop minus IR so I write minus I1 times 200 ohms and then we continue around loop B up the middle leg until we get to the 100 ohm resistor here we're traveling up the leg whereas the current is traveling down this is going to indicate a voltage lift plus IR so I write plus I2 times 100 ohms. Complete loop B. Set this equal to 0. And at this point, the physics of determining the current in this problem is done. All that's left is some algebra. We have three equations, three unknowns. We can solve this. I'm going to start with the middle equation here. Solve for I2. Now I'm going to do something a little unorthodox for physicists. I'm going to drop the units. This is pretty much the only time I ever do this, but when using Kirchhoff's rules, it makes the equations much easier to handle, especially when they get really hairy. So this is what my equation looks like. I'm going to solve this for I2. I2 is equal to 0 0.015 amps, or 15 milliamps. I box this up, 
And now I'm going to use this value to solve for I1 in the equation above. I'm going to plug it in here and solve for I1. Again, I'm going to drop my units, rewriting the equation. By the way, if you're comfortable with linear algebra, you may want to set these equations up in a matrix and solve for the variables that way. Often, that is a much simpler way of handling the algebra. In this case, I'm just going to plug and chug. So this product is equal to 1.5 volts. Move it to the other side. I have negative 200 I1 is equal to positive 7.5. So we have I1 equals 0 0.0375 amps. Oh, don't forget this negative sign here. That's important. Negative 0 0.0375 amps or negative 37.5 milliamps. So what does this negative sign tell us? This negative sign tells us that the direction that we chose for I1 is the wrong direction. Remember how we picked it arbitrarily at the beginning of the problem? Well, here's where we find out that the actual direction of positive charge flow is the other way. No harm, no foul. Now we know the correct direction of the currents. So we're going to take I1 and I2, plug them into the junction rule to determine I0. So I0 is equal to negative 0 0.0375 plus 0 0.015. So we have I0 is equal to negative 0 0.0225 amps, or negative 22.5 milliamps. I'm going to box this up. And again, what this negative sign is telling us is the direction that we assigned for current is the incorrect direction of the positive charge flow. It's actually moving the other way. So now that we have the currents in this circuit, we can determine the voltage drops across the resistors using the current and the resistance values. In other words, we're going to use Ohm's law. So for current, we use the 15 milliamp value and the 100 ohm value. And we find out that the voltage drop across the 100 ohm resistor is going to be 1.5 volts. I'm going to do the same thing for the 200 ohm resistor, but to conserve some space here, I'm going to skip the calculation and just get to the value. So using that current and the 200 ohm resistor, we have a value of 7.5 volts for the voltage drop across the 200 ohm resistor. To determine the power dissipated by these resistors, we simply multiply the current through by the voltage across, IV. And we find out for the 100 ohm resistor, we're going to use the 15 milliamps for the current and 1.5 volts we just determined. And we find out that the power dissipated by the 100 ohm resistor is going to be 0 0.225 watts. 22.5 milliwatts. And to determine the power dissipated by the 200 ohm resistor, we're just going to multiply the current times its resistance value, which yields 281 and a quarter milliwatts. And I'll box this up. And we're done. So there you have it. The current through, the voltage across, and the power dissipated by resistors using Kirchhoff's rules. I'm Jesse Mason. I hope this was helpful to you. And until next time, happy learning. Hello, everyone. I'm Jesse Mason. And in this episode of the Teach Me series, we'll learn the basics of Kirchhoff's rules and see how they're applied to circuits. Kirchhoff's rules, sometimes referred to as Kirchhoff's circuit laws, are a pair of rules used typically to analyze DC circuits. The first rule that we'll examine is Kirchhoff's junction rule. The junction rule states that the sum of the currents flowing, and yes, I know that current flow is a bit redundantly redundant. Anyway, the sum of the currents flowing into a junction is equal to the sum of the currents flowing out of said junction. Mathematically speaking, current in equals current out. Sounds simple enough, right? Let's take a look at a circuit diagram for a junction to elucidate this rule. We'll take a simple three-way junction and label it J1. We'll draw current flowing into J1 from the left, call it I1, and current flowing out the right leg and down the vertical leg, I2 and I3 respectively, 
how exactly did we decide the directions and labels for these currents? We'll address this very good question momentarily. So applying the junction rule to J1, we have current in, that's just I1, equals current out, which is I2 plus I3. And that's it. That's how the junction rule is applied to a junction. Before we move on, I'm impelled to point out that Kirchhoff's junction rule is just a consequence of a more physically significant principle, namely the principle of conservation of charge. So we can sort of think of J1 as a fork in the road where the cars, I mean the charges, either continue traveling to the right or turn and move downward. Got it? Good. Now let's examine Kirchhoff's other rule, the loop rule. The loop rule states that for any closed loop, the sum of the voltage lifts is equal to the sum of the voltage drops. We'll define a closed loop as any continuous path in the circuit which ends where it started. The loop rule stated mathematically is the net voltage for a closed loop equals zero. Okay, now let's look at a simple circuit to see how we apply the loop rule. Here we'll have a voltage across the source, V sub S, and a voltage across the resistor, V sub R. Since it's a simple circuit, we'll have a singular current and its direction of positive charge flow is clockwise due to the orientation of the voltage source. Next, we'll label our circuit loop, loop A. Note that for most circuits, currents and loops won't coincide and need to be explicitly labeled separately. Okay, to apply the loop rule to loop A, we'll travel clockwise around the loop summing voltages. Starting on the bottom left, we'll have positive V sub S, a voltage lift, and then moving around to the other side, we'll have negative V sub R, a voltage drop. We set that equal to zero, and that is how we apply the loop rule. By the way, Kirchhoff's loop rule, like the junction rule, has its physical roots in a conservation law, namely the principle of conservation of energy. Okay, now let's discuss the conventions associated with Kirchhoff's rules. The first two conventions relate to the loop rule in identifying voltage lifts and drops. If we're moving around a loop and we travel through a battery, while summing voltages, and we go from low to high, which is to say going from the negative terminal to the positive terminal, then the voltage of the battery is treated as a positive voltage, which we'll call a voltage lift because of the increase in electrical potential. If instead we travel through a battery high to low, that is positive to negative, the voltage is treated as negative, which we'll call a voltage drop because of the decrease in electrical potential. So for voltage sources, low to high, we have a positive voltage. High to low, we have a negative voltage. It turns out that the sign of the voltage across a resistor also depends on the direction of our labeled current. So if we follow a current while summing voltages through a resistor, then the voltage across the resistor is negative V, or invoking Ohm's law, negative I times R. Mm, drop. If instead we oppose the direction of the labeled current as we pass through the resistor, then the voltage across the resistor is treated as positive I times R. So for resistors, follow the current, negative IR. Oppose the current, positive IR. Now a lot has been said about the directions of currents and loops. How are these directions initially decided? This is the best part. The directions of loops and currents are assigned and labeled arbitrarily with absolutely no preference in direction. So long as the circuit is correctly analyzed using Kirchhoff's rules, the actual direction of positive charge flow will be revealed in our results. So it's kind of like choose your own adventure in physics land. physics land. One final convention relating to labeling our circuit diagram. Typically, we'll use one more loop than the number of junctions in the circuit. So be sure to have enough of them labeled before applying Kirchhoff's rules. I'm Jesse Mason, and I hope you found this video helpful. If you have any suggestions for future Teach Me videos, or just want to say hello from your part of the world, please do so in the comments below. And as always, happy learning! <laughs>